A long time ago, when I was a boy, I learned a lot at my mother's knee. And among those many lessons were, don't leave a mess for other folks to have to clean up and learn from your mistakes. Wind's a miraculous thing. It can cool you down after a hot day and dry the clothes hanging on a line and turn a windmill to fill a stock tank. In the late 1800s, an Ohio man from Cleveland, Charles Brush, built the first large windmill. It was designed to generate electricity. It was successful, but it only generated a small amount of electricity, and then only when the wind was blowing. Steam, it turned out, was a more reliable energy source. Inventors tinkered with the wind-to-electricity problem for years. The low cost of coal and the emergence of inexpensive nuclear power in the late 1950s kept the development of wind-fueled electricity on the back burner until the Arab oil crisis of 1973. Even though it was clear to most people that Arab oil isn't used for the production of electricity, there was a stampede toward development of wind-fueled electric generation in this country. The U.S. government offered wind power developers an energy tax credit of 15 percent and an additional 10 percent federal tax credit. The state of California offered a 50 percent state energy credit, creating an artificial market for wind electricity. Well, needless to say, California is where the first large wind projects in the United States were located. Eventually, there were more than 16,000 wind turbines operating in California, dominated by turbines made in Denmark. This is the wind installation at Altamont Pass, California. These wind turbines were photographed nearly three decades after they were first erected. Many of the turbines at Altamont were failed designs and haven't generated electricity for 20 years. An unintended consequence of the location of these wind facilities on windy mountain ridges was their impact on eagles and other birds. The folks promoting wind power were so fired up to get it going that they never gave a thought to what the consequences might be of putting all those spinning blades in the bird's airspace. Birds are not only killed by the turning blades, but also by the collisions with the towers. And that includes towers that were left standing, but no longer generating electricity. 14,000 of California's 16,000 turbines were abandoned. The Golden Gate Audubon Society estimates between 75 and 110 golden eagles and over 1,000 other birds are killed every year by the turbines at Altamont despite tethering the turbines for the fourth month migrating season. Kind of reminds me of Mom's first principle. Don't leave your mess for others to clean up. Today we're seeing a renewed interest in government subsidies and requirements for alternative energy. Government grants, and tax credits, mandates on the fuel used to generate the electricity you buy have started a new rush to saturate the country with as many wind plants as the land can support. Wind plants are sprouting on Allegheny Ridge tops like toadstools after the rain. In 2002, Florida Power and Light built the Mountaineer Wind Plant in Tucker County, West Virginia the largest wind project east of the Mississippi at the time. They used more modern NEG Micon turbines made in Denmark. In 2004, a Ph.D. student at the University of Maryland discovered that somewhere between 1,500 to 4,000 bats were being killed by those turbines every year. Later research showed that in a six-week period, 2,093 dead bats were recovered in the year 2003 and 1,672 were found dead in a similar six-week study in 2004. Every year, bats kill millions of mosquitoes, moths, and other harmful insects that affect our lives and livelihood. Bats are an essential part of the balance of nature. Experts estimate bat deaths to range from 21 to 70 per turbine per year in the Allegheny Mountains. In a more recent wind turbine bat kill study in Pennsylvania, these researchers found that bat mortality could be reduced by shutting down the turbines at times and wind speeds when bats were flying. That would reduce the generation of electricity by 11% for the part of the year when bats are active. That's in addition to times when there's little or no wind at all. The question is, are wind plant owners and operators willing to accept this solution? And while turbine designers work on solving the bird and bat kill problem they didn't expect, 
Hundreds of new wind farm proposals are being accepted, affecting the quality of life in mountain counties from Maine to North Carolina. The Mountaineer Wind Project in West Virginia and several in Pennsylvania are nearing the midpoint of their 20-year life expectancy. Looking at the government's wind resource map of the United States, it's easy to see where wind facilities will be the least productive. Today's wind plants are being built and operated with generous government grants and assistance which may not last as political climates change. It's a short trip from unrenewed tax credits, low productivity, curtailments for birds and bats to aging machinery and abandonment. Who will clean up the mess when the wind rush stops? That brings me to Mom's second admonition, learn from your mistakes. Wind developers worm their way into the hearts of local government with donations to civic institutions. A fire truck here, a donation to the historical society there, maybe some new uniforms for the high school band. All this amounts to a tiny percentage of the profits and corporate tax breaks the wind corporations will get in return. It takes just as much skilled labor and specialized machinery to disassemble an industrial wind turbine as it did to put it up in the first place. Our representatives in government can require a complete decommissioning at the end of a wind plant's useful life. This is a subject wind developers would rather avoid. Ask a wind developer if he'll pay to take the turbines down and remove the towers and the bases at the end of their 20-year life, and he'll probably tell you it's your responsibility or that of the folks who are leasing them the land. And you'll hear that decommissioning will pay for itself in the scrap value of the turbines with their fiberglass blades and concrete bases. It cost about $3 million a turbine to put them up. What's the going rate for concrete rubble these days? We're told that wind is the energy provider of the future and that coal is a thing of the past. The question we should be asking is how long will this wind energy fad last? Let's recap some of the reasons why industrial wind power might have a short life in the Allegheny Highlands. First and foremost, industrial wind energy is not and can never be a base load source of electrical power because of the intermittent nature of the wind. Industrial wind is land use intensive when compared with fossil and nuclear electric generating plants. Industrial wind energy is highly subsidized and subject to the whims of political climate. The Allegheny Highlands have poor wind resources when compared with other regions of the United States and offshore areas. Shortened hours of turbine operation due to bird and bat mortality concerns reduce energy output even more. Decommissioning plans are necessary to restore the environment when industrial wind projects are no longer popular or abandoned. My mama didn't raise no fool. I bet yours didn't either. Just one more story to put a point on it. Wind developers walking away from outmoded wind installations isn't only confined to California. This is South Point on the big island of Hawaii. Kamaoa Wind Project was constructed in 1985. After a few good years of production and a steady decline, it was abandoned in 2006. And this is how it stands today.